Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Dusan Ichneider. I am the moderator of this webinar and let me welcome you on this. The topic for this webinar is advertising law year in review. This is one piece from the series of the similar webinars that we are organizing uh, for different regions of the world. Uh, you might have been noticed or some of you might have participated in early webinars for Americas or Asia and Pacific. We are the GALA, the Global Advertising Lawyers Alliance, a unique organization that is connecting the advertising media and intellectual property lawyers from, from all the world. And we are bringing you this summary of the year 2020 just to know that there, been, that there has been something more than just the COVID issues. Let me introduce you today's speakers. We will start our presentations with the presentation of Kim Rampersad from Adams & Adams, South Africa. She'll be followed by Michelle Bejot from the Bernard Herz & Bejot, France. Then you will hear uh, our colleague Donata Cordone from uh, Portolano and Cavallo law firm in Italy. After, after Donata, there will be a Brinsley Dresden from the Louis Silkin from United Kingdom. Hello, Brinsley. And we will close our presentations and close this webinar by the presentation of Maria Ostashenko from a law firm Alarut from Russia. We have planned this webinar for about an hour. And we also planned a space at the end of this webinar to answer your questions. You are probably seeing on your desktops the Q&A option on the right bottom part of your screens. If you will find or if you will have a question during the presentations of any of the speakers, just write it there. I will try to, um, to manage those questions and let's say, present them to the speakers at the end of the presentations. For the sake of the completeness of the information, watch, or I'm just putting to your attention uh, our webpage, which is www.galalaw.com. On the right hand side, there is a blog section where all the GALA members are publishing quite oftenly news and interesting articles about advertising law developments in their countries. That's all for the beginning. Let me virtually pass the microphone to Kim. Kim, you are ready to go. Thank you, Dushan. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Rampersov. I'm a partner in the Trademark Litigation Department of Adams & Adams, specializing in brand enforcement, and my practice includes ad law disputes. Today, I will be discussing with you decisions issued by our Advertising Regulatory Board, as well as legislative developments affecting the advertisement of tobacco and liquor products in South Africa. The Advertising Regulatory Board in South Africa is responsible for administering the Code of Advertising Practice. It's based on the International Code of Advertising. However, it's been contextualized to regulate circumstances specific to South Africa. The discussion today of these decisions is intended to provide you with a synopsis of the implementation of the code by the ARB. The first case deals with a consumer complaint against an advert by a career services company. The advert in question shows a well-known South African comedian and actor, Skalk Bezadenhout, attempting to post a stuffed toy banana to his girlfriend, and he demonstrates the ease with which one can use the drop-off and pick-up boxes of the career services company, and he goes on to explain that it is as simple as putting something into a dwarf, and it's a matter of finding the correct size of dwarf for your pisang. And he subsequently then receives the banana as a female and explains with glee, I always sleep better with golf pisang. The advertisement in question turns on double entendre or sexual innuendos conveyed by the double meanings of the words dwarf and pisang, those are Afrikaans words where Afrikaans is a widely spoken language in South Africa. And the meanings of the word sitang is obviously banana. And dwarf, the defined meaning is a container or a package. But the uncouth meanings, which are also well known, include a reference to a dumb or stupid person and to female genitalia. And as a result, the advert received numerous consumer complaints, especially from parents of young children, 
on the basis that it is vulgar and offensive. And the ARB had to consider whether in the context of, of the code it is offensive in terms of clause one and vulgar and whether it gives harm or causes harm to children. And the ARB found that it was neither offensive nor was it harmful to children. However, it was inappropriate because children who are conversant in Afrikaans may often repeat the words sitang and dwarf without appreciating these subtleties and the fact that they convey a sexual innuendo. And so the advertisement, um, it was directed only broadcast during the watershed hours. The second case is also a consumer complaint against an advertisement for an alcoholic beverage. The advertisements in question were a television commercial and billboard advertisement. The billboard advertisement is depicted here. And the television commercial makes use of the words the new Savannah Jean, spelled J-E-A-N, the crisp juniper flavored cider, and the billboard advertisement, as you can see on the slide, shows how the product is depicted in a shaker and makes use of the words G's and T's apply. Insofar as the consumer was concerned, it was misleading because it suggested that the end product was a gin as opposed to a cider. And he specifically relied on the fact that the advertiser made use of the word gene, J-E-A-N, which is intended to convey the mispronunciation of the word gin in South Africa, which mispronunciation is actually quite common. And the ARB had to consider whether or not the advertisement was misleading in the context of the code. And it found that whereas the advertisement caused some level of discomfort in the sense that it promoted the product as an alternative to gin, the fact remained that it was not a gin and it was patently obvious from the advertisements where the words, the new crisp juniper flavored cider and savannah cider and savannah the unapologetic cider appeared. And so the complaint was dismissed. These decisions show how language and interpretation play a role in advertising in South Africa and how one may unwittingly fall foul of the code. And of course, no review would be complete without a COVID related case. This complaint also saw a consumer complain against an advertisement by a domestic airline in South Africa. The advertisement was screened at a time when lockdown regulations were eased in South Africa to allow for domestic travel by an airline. Um, and the advertisement in question shows initially people boarding an aircraft where they are wearing masks and adhering to social distancing. And subsequently, there are scenes with people socializing and not adhering to COVID protocols. And the consumer complained that there was obviously a disregard for regulations and that the advertisement set a double standard. The ARB had to consider the complaint in the context of the legality clause and safety clause and found that it did in fact contravene these clauses. And so the complaint was upheld and the advertisement was withdrawn. The ARB specifically found that it did imply that when one is traveling, you should adhere to all COVID protocols, which are mandatory now in South Africa. But when one is on holiday or in the company of family and friends, you need not adhere to the protocols, which is actually illegal and incorrect. And this brings me to my second point of discussion, which relates to the complete ban of tobacco and liquor during South Africa, um, the lockdown in South Africa. There was an extensive period where the sale and dispensing of the products were prohibited. And in theory, people were not drinking and smoking. And as a result, um, it seems, of the ban, certain legislation that is intended to regulate the advertisement of these products seems to have been fast-tracked, specifically the control of tobacco products and a nicotine delivery systems bill um, seems to have been fast-tracked. It is anticipated that this bill will come before our parliament by the end of this year and that it may be enacted as early as next year. Should the bill become law, we will see the introduction of standardized or plain packaging in South Africa, as well as the introduction of other regulations that are attempted to further restrict the advertisements of these products. Specifically, there is a call for the use of graphic health warnings on the packaging and a prohibition on point of sale advertising. These are the only forms of advertising allowed in relation to tobacco products currently. So if the legislation becomes effective, we will see a total ban on the advertisements, specifically in regards to or with regards to traditional advertising techniques. This depicts what the likely packaging will look like, and it is very much in line with what we've seen in other countries that have implemented similar legislation, such as Australia and the likes of Singapore. Other developments include um, legislation affecting the advertisement of liquor products. Um, to place this in context, just by way of background in South Africa, there was a bill in 2016 that was published intended to amend um, liquor advertising laws. Specifically, it's thought to prohibit 
the advertisement of these products in certain forms of media and to introduce health warnings, express and graphic health warnings to be applied to the packaging of these goods. That bill was subjected to extensive public comment and was subsequently referred back to the director committee for drafting. And later, an unpublished bill with stricter regulations, although not published, was released or leaked via the media. This slide gives you an indication of the comparison between the uh, bill. Apologies for it being quite small. But um, what you'll see on the right-hand side, which is the unpublished and strictable, that there's an attempt there to prohibit advertising on, of liquor products in social media, on the internet, in cinemas. And there's also a call for advertisements to specifically give light to or to highlight the harmful effects of liquor abuse and not simply include responsibility messages. It seems that as a result of this attempt to ban advertisements relating to liquor products, the industry itself has taken it upon itself to further self-regulate and either conform to the anticipated legislation or perhaps even prevent that legislation from coming into effect. It's not quite clear what the intention was per se and whether it has been successful, but the Code of Commercial Communications by the liquor industry is currently part of our advertising code in South Africa, and the changes that were introduced at the beginning of this year and which formally become effective by February next year are many, and they include things such as limited screen time for advertisements for liquor products on television and on radio. There's also further regulations regarding content and how one may not use any icon or imagery that would appeal to underage drinkers or minors um, and children. And as well, the code still envisages the advertisement of um, products digitally. However, there is a call for age verification software to be used. And this is in contrast, of course, to the unpublished version of the liquor bill. But despite this attempt by the liquor industry to try and introduce its own further regulations, um, it seems that government may be quite hell-bent on moving towards the ban, because in October we saw a white paper published by the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies, and that paper envisages specific licenses for the, adver for the advertisement of liquor products on audio and audiovisual content services. The effect is that these advertisements will fall under ministerial control and regulation, where the minister can publish specific regulations relating to their placement and conduct. Of course, the concern is that with these industries being subjected to such strict advertising rules, other industries will follow suit, not by choice, but by law. Um, and, of course, the conflicts with the right to commercial expression and with one's trademark rights, which is very concerning in our field of law. And that's a wrap for South Africa. Thanks. Kim, thank you very much for this, let's say, quick overview and wrap-up and summary for 2020 uh, trends and development in South Africa. Michelle, you're the next. Microphone is yours. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all, wherever you are. Uh, my uh, year in review for France in a few minutes uh, will be mostly um, on uh, or impacted by COVID and sustainable development. Um, we'll go through three points, uh, examples of what we saw on the client's front during lockdown. Uh, recent changes in uh, advertising rules impacted by COVID and by sustainable development, and some uh, concerns, some looming, looming legislation that is coming. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, the, um, what we saw on the client's front relates to, among other, other things, uh, relates to uh, social distancing and, and uh, COVID rules in ads, uh, media chronology uh, rules, and force majeure and COVID. Uh, next, um, social distancing in ads. We've been asked by, very frequently by uh, our clients, advertisers, and advertising agencies whether they had to comply with health and social distancing, uh, the mandatory use of masks in ads, etc. And the French SRO did not uh, enact any specific rules, uh, publish anything on the subject, but they have a clear position for now, uh, which is that it is an exceptional situation. 
uh, the confinement and social distancing are exceptional measures so that the advertisers and uh, advertising agencies are not required to uh, conform to those rules in the ads. Uh, that, uh, next slide, that does not um, mean that it's open bar and that anything goes. The, the French SRO is uh, watching, is encouraging uh, responsible behavior uh, from advertising uh, organizations. Uh, for example, the use in ad campaigns of hurry up and go fast before tonight, uh, buy today, go today, uh, are restricted or discouraged uh, in times of confinement. The general idea is do not, through your ads, encourage the violation of the confinement rules. Um, next. the um, the um, the French Parliament, um, uh, the, actually the French government, sorry, uh, introduced uh, a series of decrees in August uh, to uh, take into account the uh, pandemic. Uh, one of them uh, relates to the chronology uh, of um, showing the movies. Uh, before the decree, one of the restrictions was a movie had to be shown in movie theaters for four months before being available on VOD platforms. That has been eased up to take into account COVID, uh, the pandemic, uh, and this is handled, uh, eased up and handled on a case-by-case -case basis by the French uh, cinema agency. Uh, next, the uh, the, the, the connection between force majeure and COVID. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you all have similar rules as in France uh, regarding what's the force majeure. Uh, you know, we always look at exteriority, unpredictability, and irresistibility. And we had uh, precedents during the pandemic in uh, 2014. The I believe it was the H1N1. Uh, not as bad as the one we have now. Uh, we had some cases where the courts refused to admit force majeure, considering that uh, it was making things difficult, uh, uh, holding on commitments and enforcing contracts difficult, but not impossible. And uh, this time, there are a few cases that we saw where courts uh, admitted that uh, it was uh, the, the impossibility factor was uh, to be taken into account. And, you know, I'm sure you all have seen the obvious examples of promotions offering as gifts travels, uh, and the travel ban comes, and that's impossible to enforce. So uh, we, we had the uh, pragmatic courts in that respect. Uh, so next is uh, more general uh, on the uh, the uh, general landscape rules on, on advertising. We had uh, another um, decree in August that um, allowed uh, the broadcast of ads to promote movies on television, movies to be shown in cinema movie theaters. Uh, before that decree, it was uh, uh, impossible or restricted, only allowed to uh, pay for channels dedicated to cinema. And now the regular channel, TV channels, can uh, advertise uh, movies shown in uh, movie theaters. The, uh, that rule is going to be uh, on a 18-month test period, and we'll see what happens. The um, the other change, also, you know, August, they were very busy, another decree in August, uh, where uh, the uh, it allows now the French national channels to broadcast at the same time different ads depending on where the targeted audience is located, which, uh, which was not possible before that decree. 
the uh, there are some conditions, for example, not possible during and after uh, TV shows for kids, and the the ad concerned has to be uh, to bear a specific mention, uh, telling the audience that it is a targeted ad. The uh, other changes. Uh, impact of the sustainable development. Uh, the, uh, the French SRO uh, had a guideline on sustainable development, has had that for quite some time. It was uh, modified this year, uh, effective August uh, of this year. And at first it looked like they tweaked it, small changes, but one major thing was introduced in it. The main change is that the scope of the guideline on sustainable development has been extended to apply to all ads, irrespective of whether or not they contain a direct or indirect sustainable development claim. So, for example, a few years ago, Lego put out an ad showing kids uh, you know, a cute uh, ad showing kids uh, playing uh, and building a scene with their Legos and ice in the freezer of the household, in the kitchen. And that was not a problem. And today, that, that ad wouldn't fly, it wouldn't work, because uh, it would be considered as not planet-friendly. Waste of energy, they play and they leave the door open. And that's a waste of energy. Um, the um, sustainable development shows also in the decisions of the French uh, SRO's jury. Uh, they that's a recent decision of October, so months and a half ago. So after the uh, guidelines were modified, and uh, during full pandemic. Uh, an ad for scooters um, showing the scooters and a, a very crowded can of sardines and using the slogan, choose less crowded transport. And the jury uh, said advertising must not discredit the principles and objectives, nor the advice and solutions commonly accepted in the field of sustainable development. It gives a negative image of public transport, encourages people to favor transport by scooter, and encourages them to buy and use a scooter, much more polluting mode of transportation. So humor did not save that ad, nor did the fact that during pandemic, most people would prefer uh, individual transportation over uh, collective public transportation. That shows, again, the impact of a sustainable development. Now, my third last point is on uh, legislation. Um, and the, um, the advertising world in France, community in France, is quite concerned because one of the cabinet members, the one in charge of environment, uh, is pushing a bill, a draft law, uh, we don't have the text yet, but uh, everybody uh, has a fair idea of what's in it from uh, the declarations of that uh, cabinet member. Um, the aim is to restrict or ban advertising for products and services that are considered harmful for the environment or the health, air travel, automobiles, and certain food products on all media. That's very controversial, evidently. The concept and the intent is highly controversial. Uh, it shows a posture and no sound reflection on, on, on the impact. The French SRO, that's usually uh, and in principle uh, neutral, uh, has expressed strong reservations on an approach that uh, seems unrealistic and uh, dogmatic and dangerous. It boils down to, uh, it would boil down to prohibiting the advertisement first before restricting or stopping the products, ignoring the uh, consumers that should be the ultimate judge of that. 
Uh, we don't know where it is going. It may or may not develop, and uh, there is strong uh, pressure from the community to avoid the ban or the restrictions and work more on information and uh, declarations accompanying the ads. Although this is not a universal solution because we have hundreds, literally hundreds of mandatory mentions in the ad regulations. Thank you. Michel, also thank you for, for your speech, for the presentations, uh, for presentations, sorry. Uh, Donata, you are now. Thanks, Jushan, and hello, everyone. Uh, well, during this uh, uh, current year, there have been some uh, important changes to the Italian legal framework on advertising. The first change concerns ambush marketing. Uh, since in last May, uh, a new law was approved in Italy regulating ambush marketing for the first time. Uh, this new law marks a new approach towards uh, uh, parasitic advertising and marketing activities uh, carried out in connection with the organization of uh, sporting events and ex exhibitions of both national and international relevance, uh, where the uh, activities are, uh, are not authorized by the organizing entities and are aimed at obtaining an economic advantage. Um, basically, uh, the new law defines the characteristics of ambush marketing and uh, uh, identifies the uh, prohibited conducts, basically uh, regarding the creation of a, con of a connection, even indirect, between a trademark and an event, uh, and also the promotion of a trademark um, uh, by means of any action carried out during the uh, uh, event, which are likely to, uh, to uh, attract the attention of the public and to generate confusion about the identity of the official sponsor. Um, then also the use of misleading advertising uh, uh, in connection with the sponsorship of the events uh, and the promotion and sale of products and services by using uh, the logo of the event or another confusing sign. Uh, Interestingly, the uh, new law, um, uh, the, the prohibition, uh, applies uh, with temporary limits, specifically um, uh, only with, by the, starting from the uh, date of registration of the trademark or logo of the event, and uh, the protection lasts until uh, 180 days after the end of the, of the event. So it is advisable to proceed with a trademark registration when organizing uh, uh, events to try to reduce the risk of ambush marketing. And in case of breach, the competition authority may apply a monetary fine up to two, uh, two and a half million euros. Before the adoption of this new law, uh, some um, uh, temporary provisions had been issued uh, on a case-by-case -case basis uh, to uh, prevent ambush marketing uh, in connection with specific events. For example, it happened in the past in, in connection with the Winter Olympics, which took place in Turin in 2006, and also in connection with Milan Expo in 2015. And consistently with this approach, the new law also includes provisions targeting specific events, for example, the Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games, which will take place in Milan and Cortina in 2026. And before the adoption of this new law, some uh, um, uh, other provisions of law were enforced to try to counter ambush marketing, mainly general provisions of law on unfair competition, misleading advertising, unfair commercial practices also, and intellectual property. And these general provisions of law can still be enforced in the future in spite of the new law, because the new law expressly says that. There has been no enforcement of the new law so far, since it is quite recent, but we monitor any new decision by the competition authority with much interest. Uh, another important change to the Italian legal framework on advertising concerns uh, new measures to counter unfair commercial practices. Um, this, these rules uh, are uh, provided by the consumer code and are enforced by the competition authority, which uh, has always had the power to issue orders uh, uh, to remove the stop the practice against the professionals which uh, carried out the practice and, um, and to impose also monetary fine against such professionals. Well, in last May, uh, a new decree was uh, approved in the context of the uh, emergency legislation, uh, um, introducing a new provision in the Consumer Code, which extended the powers of the competition authority by empowering the authority to, um, to, to issue orders about the removal of unfair practices, also towards uh, suppliers of connectivity services to Internet networks, uh, and towards operators of other telematic and telecommunication networks and services. So based on the order, the operators must uh, uh, 
um, uh, prevent access to the networks they manage or through which they provide the services to avoid the continuation of the unfair practice. And in case of non-compliance with such order, the competition authority may issue a fine up to 5 million euros against the uh, operators concerned. This new provision of law aims also to align uh, Italian consumer protection rules with European ones, because there is a European regulation, the one referenced at the bottom of this slide concerning cooperation between, between national consumer protection authorities, which gives certain powers to such authorities. For example, they can um, adopt interim measures to um, uh, avoid the risk of a serious harm to the collective interest of consumers. They can remove uh, content or um, restrict access to online interfaces or order service providers to remove content or restrict access to online interfaces or they can order that um, a warning is displayed uh, to consumers on online interfaces and so on. So these new provisions um, basically provide for powers uh, which are in line with those provided at an European level, but it will be interesting to see how these new provisions will be imposed by the competition authority because potentially it is a really strong tool in the hands of the authority, especially in these times. Um, there is one last point I would like to briefly talk about. It does not concern a law development, but rather some interesting trends in connection with influencer marketing. In the last couple of years, uh, there have been some interesting uh, cases dealt with by both the Italian Competition Authority and the Italian Advertising Sessio Regulatory Vari in connection with the influencer marketing. And one of the most interesting cases is uh, the recent Barilla case, uh, which involved the Barilla brand. The, the decision was issued in last uh, February. Basically, the authority um, challenged the failure to, um, to use the specific labels required to disclose the advertising nature of posts made by uh, influencers on social media and started the proceeding against both Varilla and the influencers involved. By way of background, uh, these rules on unfair commercial practices, including the provision requiring transparency in advertising, um, are enforced by the competition authority and can be fined with a monetary fine. But in some cases, the professional, the potential infringer, infringer, may propose undertakings to remove the unfairness of the practice, and the authority may decide to accept such undertakings. And in this case, the authority does not assert an infringement and does not impose any monetary fine. And this is exactly what happened in connection with all the influencer marketing cases dealt with so far by the competition authority, including the Barilla case. And the interesting trends that was mentioned before um, result from the undertaking, uh, undertaking proposed by Barilla in this case, uh, accepted by the authority and uh, uh, considered, by, considered by the authority as good practices in connection with influencer marketing contracts. So the contract between the brand and the influencer and also the contracts uh, executed by the agency of the influencer. Uh, basically, uh, person to this, uh, this case, uh, some ad hoc, ad hoc guidelines uh, sh should be um, on transparent advertising should be drafted by the brand and uh, circulated internally uh, to all the company departments involved in marketing activities to make everybody aware of the importance of the matter. Such guidelines should be attached to the agreement between the brand and the influencer to make the influencer aware of the importance of the matter uh, and also to share the labels uh, to be used by the influencer on social media. Such agreements should also uh, include some, uh, let's say, deterrent mechanisms to apply in case of breach of the guidelines by the influencer, for example, a reduction of the contractual price or a suspension of its payment or other kind of penalties. Uh, as to the contract with, between the brand and the agency of the influencer, it should include uh, um, uh, um, an obligation upon the agency to monitor on the activity carried out by the influencer and also the same deterrent mechanisms mentioned before to apply in case of breach of this obligation by the agency. Uh, as well as also an obligation upon the agency to insert in its agreement with the influencer, so in the agreement between agency and influencer, the same guidelines on transparent advertising and also the same deterrent mechanisms mentioned before to apply in case of breach of, uh, of the guidelines, of course, by the influencer. To be clear, uh, these are, are not low requirements, uh, but, but these points reflect the criteria that today are used by uh, the Italian Competition Authority and also by the Italian uh, Advertising Self-Regulatory Body in light of other previous cases uh, to assess the possible uh, responsibility of uh, brands, uh, of uh, agencies and of influencers in influencer marketing cases. So it would be advisable to take these points uh, in, into account while drafting influencer contracts.
Thanks. Dorada, thanks. You were precisely in the time slot that was <laughs> devoted to your speech. Thank you for being so sharp. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. Okay, Brinsley, now it's your turn to tell us something about UK development. Um, so, um, I decided um, when I was putting these slides together to avoid um, two subjects which I'm tired of talking about. One is COVID and the other is Brexit. So, you won't hear anything about me from, from me on either of those subjects. And uh, what you can see there is what I'm going to, to talk about. Um, so, the first topic is gender stereotyping. We've had a new rule last year. Um, which was quite controversial about gender stereotyping in advertising. And at the beginning of the year, we had um, yet another um, ASA decision. This one, the previous ones were about TV ads. This one was the first one about a poster ad. And you can see, you might recognize that is a, um, a poster on the London Underground on the Tube Network, picture of a young woman. And the headline is, um, you do the girl boss thing, we'll do the SEO thing. Um, this prompted 19 complaints um, on the basis that it was perpetuating a harmful stereotype and that it was also patronizing, suggesting that women aren't capable of using IT. Um, the response from the advertiser was that it was intended to celebrate women successfully negotiating the tightrope of work-life balance. Um, sorry, let's say work-life balance, not lie balance. Um, and that the girl boss was a reference to a popular book. They also said that the, the media agency that um, sells all of the poster space in the London Underground, they had pre-approved the ad as, as is usual, and they hadn't seen a problem with it. The ASA said, well, we still think that uh, we're going to uphold the complaint because it plays the stereotype that women can't be the boss. Um, there were concerns that people might not have heard of the book, which I think is is a reasonable concern. I never had none of those. Um, and also that it had the stereotype that women lack tech skills. Um, contrast with that, with a complaint from only a couple of weeks ago, this was a TV commercial. Um, and it was for a uh, right move, which is a, a sort of a stage agency, um, a realtor, the Americans would call it. Only the one complaint, but one complaint can be valid. And basically, um, the story is the father taking refuge in the garden shed to escape from his wife and four daughters and the dog. And the dog is wearing a pink bow, so we think the dog is a girl dog too. Um, and the idea is that the family needs a bigger house. The complaint was that it um, depicted females as being demanding and annoying, and also that it suggested men don't take responsibility for childcare. Um, right Move said, no, it's just about needing more space. Um, we're not contrasting the need of either parent for space, and the father is depicted as a loving father. So in this case, and I think this is the first one that the ASA has taken all the way through to a formal hearing and then decide not to uphold it. They said, yes, it draws on gender stereotypes, but not in a harmful way. So the complaint was not upheld. Uh, next, um, clearly one of the other big events from this year has been the whole Black Lives Matter movement, and I'm afraid some of the responses have not been uh, as well considered as one might hope. So this was a, a, a local advert for a car dealer, um, which is leasing cars. You can see the headline there, Black Lives Matter. And then the line, once you go back, you go black, you never go back. Um, and the clenched fist in, um, symbol. So, um, this generated three complaints about, which is quite a lot for a Facebook post. Uh, on the basis that the words and images were offensive and sensitive and likely to cause serious and widespread offence. And that, although there were only three, it's still possible that that could uh, be in breach. The advertiser, which is a very small company, said, well, the phrases were puns and the images were positive, so we don't think there's a problem. But the ASA didn't agree. They said that the, the sexual references objectified and fetishized black men, this, this uh, phrase, which is certainly used in the UK, of once you've had black, you never go back. Um, the the product, in this case, the car leasing, was unrelated to the Black Lives Matter protests, and so it was socially responsible and likely to cause serious and widespread offence. 
Um, this one I've just put in for, for reference. This was, a, again, a Facebook ad for a gym in, in Luton, which talked about celebrating um, Black History Month by reference to 12 years of slave. Just an unbelievably stupid advertisement. There was a massive backlash about this on, on, on the social media. And so the ad was withdrawn very quickly before there was an opportunity to take any enforcement action. Um, if you're interested in, in this subject generally, then I'd invite you to have a look at this long article that I, uh, I wrote this year where I went into quite some detail about the history of uh, racism in British advertising. Next, um, I wanted to talk about greenwashing and the, U, the, the uh, move to net zero. Um, interesting decision by um, the Guardian newspaper, which is a leading uh, serious broadsheet newspaper in the UK. It's the only one that really has a sort of centre-left or left-of-centre kind of editorial line. And they announced in January that they would no longer be accepting any ads from fossil fuel companies, which is quite significant because The Guardian is always struggling for, um, for revenue and to make ends meet. Um, and so it was a, quite an interesting principle decision. Then in February, we had this decision about um, an ASA decision about the claims by Ryanair, Europe's lowest fares, lowest emissions airline. And um, there are 167 complaints about that, which is a lot, and suggests that many members of the public are interested in this issue. Um, it covered not just that press ad that you saw, but also some TV and radio ads. And basically, the claims were that um, they were questioning whether Ryanair could substantiate these claims. Um, they also used the qualifier, Ryanair has the lowest carbon emissions of any major airline. They used a good measure, which is um, carbon dioxide per passenger kilometre, which is a good measure in this context. And I have successfully defended other advertisers on that basis. Um, but they only had data for four other airlines, and it wasn't clear uh, what, it, what qualifies as a major airline. Also, some of their substantiation was out of date. So the decision was to uphold the complaint as the basis of the claims was unclear and the substantiation was insufficient. Then, very significantly, our statutory regulator, the um, Competition and Markets Authority, launched an investigation last month into whether the criminal law in this area, the, the consumer protection regulations, can deal with <coughs> excuse me, false and misleading environmental claims. And they've asked these four questions that you can see here. Um, basically, they're interested in this central issue of whether these kinds of claims can mislead consumers and therefore break the consumer protection regulations. So it's useful. I think uh, we probably will see uh, an uptake and, and maybe in, in next year and onwards, people like Ryanair may find themselves actually being prosecuted. Um, another interesting development were ads for CBD products. Um, so this was a company called Easy Life um, advertising their miracle pain patch. <clears throat> and um, sorry, again, just one complaint, all sorts of medicinal style claims here for the patch, but it's not a, the product is not licensed as a medicinal product. And therefore it's inappropriate to be, well, it's illegal to be making these sorts of claims about uh, being able to cure or prevent or treat a disease uh, or an adverse condition. Um, they were lucky really that they were only investigated by the Advertising Standards Authority uh, rather than being prosecuted for breaching the criminal law. Um, we did then see the, the regulator, the ASA, issue some new guidance about advertising for CBD products, and you'll recognize there my skill from With Nell and I, a great British movie. Um, and this basically sets out these points of guidance um, about what you should do if you want to advertise CBD products. So we are seeing these increasingly used, uh, and there's more guidance now available uh, about what advertisers need to do in order to stay on the right side of the regulators. Um, finally, I wanted to talk about further restrictions on HFS advertising. So that's food which is high in fat, 
sugar and salt. Um, the, the Prime Minister, you can see our old Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, tucking into what we call a 99 ice cream. Um, and then you can see the new Boris Johnson, the post-COVID Boris Johnson, um, wearing a mask and um, deciding that his own um, experience of suffering from COVID was all down to the fact that he uh, was overweight and therefore that the whole country needs to go on a diet. Um, now, last year, there was a consultation by the government about uh, tightening the rules on HFSS advertising. We have a ban at the moment on advertising around programs which are likely to appeal to the under 16s. Um, but this doesn't always catch some programs that do have quite a big child audience, like the Saturday night talent shows. So the proposal there, the consultation that we've already had, was about banning all HFSS ads on television before nine o'clock. Um, the new consultation, which is underway at the moment and finishes in about three weeks' time, is about banning all ads um, directed at UK kids in online advertising. It's very draconian. I think it's an absolute nonsense. There's no way they can enforce it. If, a, if, a, if an advertiser based in Italy um, has an ad that can be seen by a child in the UK, it's completely unclear how that could ever be enforced. Um, it's also disproportionate because we already have existing rules. So it's a very uh, poorly thought through consultation, like most proposals from this government. Um, if you would like to know any more, then there's lots more about all of these subjects uh, on our blog at adlaw.lewisilkin.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brinsley, for avoiding topics like Brexit and COVID. And of course, thank you for your interesting presentation. Let's now move to our final speaker, Maria Ostashenko. Maria, please go ahead and tell us about developments in Russia. Hello, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present. Um, I unfortunately cannot uh, avoid the topic of COVID in Russia because it's um, one of uh, the main uh, hot topics in the advertising area this year. So please uh, um, take my apologies <laughs> in advance. So uh, besides the COVID uh, topic, uh, we also have developments for the pharmaceuticals uh, market uh, where the regulator Federal Anti-Monopoly Service has issued um, important guidelines. Also, we have um, some interesting cases relating to influencers. And we have uh, this year adopted a federal law uh, banning the ads of electronic cigarettes. Uh, it was quite a gray area for uh, a number of years, actually. And uh, starting from the next year, from January 2021, there will be a ban of advertising in this area. So, um, going to the COVID-19, uh, of course, um, we cannot uh, we cannot ignore this as a, as a factor, and uh, the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service uh, has um, uh, considered uh, several cases uh, regarding the COVID and the advertising claims um, uh, due to this um, circumstance and pandemic. Um, the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service urges pharmaceutical manufacturers to be accurate and to be very careful when they choose um, the wording they use for description of products and avoiding abuse and uh, misleading information. Um, one of the cases uh, which is relevant is Arbidol case. Uh, so it's, uh, it's quite an old uh, medicine which was registered well some time ago and in the patient um, information there was indication that this medicine can be used for treating uh, against coronavirus. So when we uh, faced uh, the pandemic this year, uh, they started um, advertising their product quite actively. 
And the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service started an uh, investigation and came to the conclusion that uh, such a claim is uh, misleading despite the fact that coronavirus is um, indicated uh, in the um, information for patients. Um, it is obvious that uh, coronavirus uh, is not a new uh, infection, but uh, also obvious that COVID-19 is not uh, something that was um, supposed to, uh, when the product was registered because the, the infection is quite new. Another case is uh, related to tests for COVID-19, and um, the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service recognized uh, Advertiser, which is a Novocom company, as well as the search engine, and they are advertising uh, platform Yandex uh, Direct, uh, violating the law on advertising because uh, there was a distribution of uh, ads for rapid tests that were not registered as medical devices. So um, this was regard, uh, recognized as unfair advertising. And another interesting case was regarding uh, veterinary clinics. Um, in April 2020, uh, Federal Anti-Monopoly Service uh, started uh, several cases against different different clinics uh, that used um, uh, like uh, keywords in in um, search engines uh, in in search engines at ads uh, like treating animals for coronavirus, preventing coronavirus in cats, and so on. And when initiating such cases, uh, it was not taken into account that uh, veterinary clinics offer services relating to the disease of animals uh, with the coronavirus that has nothing to do with COVID-19. So at the end, the advertisers um, succeeded to prove that uh, they are they uh, were not um, advertising uh, some treatment for coronavirus-19, so the, the human uh, version, and the cases were terminated. Then uh, important uh, development is uh, for pharmaceuticals also, uh, the, guidelines, uh, the guidelines that were issued by the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service in June 2020. Uh, and this uh, document um, has several interesting interpretations, so given some freedom to the market players. Um, for instance, uh, the, there is a principle uh, that is stated in the document that advertising of goods or services that require license or permit without uh, a license or a permit is not allowed, which is like a general principle, of course. Um, but um, uh, in comparison with other uh, sectors like banking or insurance, in the pharmaceutical industry, there is no need to indicate the, um, uh, the license or permit. You just need to have it. Then uh, advertising of medical devices that require special training uh, should be allowed only at the venues um, uh, that are designated specially for professionals, um, like um, pharmaceutical exhibitions or conference, special professional conferences. And again, um, the issue of uh, how you classify medical device, so whether it requires or a training or not is not uh, the matter of competence of the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service. It's rather a question to a company and to a Ministry of Health. And then, um, obviously, the prescription uh, products and uh, advertising of uh, medicines uh, should be accompanied with different kinds of uh, disclaimers. And here again, the Federal Anti Monopoly Service um, interpreted in a way that it's up to the company to decide what kind of uh, disclaimer they use uh, dependent on the product. So this is um, 
not not bad for uh, advertisers at the end. Uh, another development in pharmaceutical industry is also uh, a recent uh, decree uh, that allows uh, Rosdravnadzor, which is a uh, regulator in the pharma industry, to block access to the uh, websites that um, uh, contain some illegal information about pharmaceutical uh, products, for instance, not registered products or counterfeited products and so on. And moving forward, we also have some developments for uh, influencers. So uh, it's already a trend that uh, the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service pays um, special attention to influencers uh, already for some time. But interesting that there is no precedent that where uh, the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service brought to liability advertisers. So at the at at the moment there is no case uh, where advertisers were held liable. It's just the liability of um, influencers. And we have several cases. One of them is, uh, well, actually they are quite similar. Um, one of them is a popular blogger, Varlamov, who showed uh, a bottle with whiskey in his material. Another one is Alexey Pivovarov, and the recent one is from September this year, is Nast Nastya Ivleva um, showing how to prepare a cocktail with the use of martini uh, brand and the bottle. Um, so I think that's it. Sorry if I was out of my time. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maria. You were definitely not out of your time. Uh, I'm just checking the Q&A section. There have, there, have, there have been a couple of Q&A questions, but I, as I see, they were all answered. Uh, if there are no other questions, and just in order to keep the timeline, let's say within one hour as we planned, let me finally mention the sources, as I just mentioned them at the beginning, but this is just a summary. You can find all relevant information about the speakers, their firms, and other firms as member, members of GALA on the GALA website. And on the right-hand side, on the GALA webpage, you can see GALA blog where all the articles about advertising, about interesting decisions, and say new bills and new guidelines passed. Thank you again, all the speakers. Thank you, uh, attendees, for your participation. I hope you found the information from this wrap-up interesting, and stay tuned. Uh, follow us on the social media. You will definitely get notice about a new webinar that we probably plan for 2021. Thank you again for, and for your attention, and uh, goodbye to everybody.